Thank you, LA. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Are folks able to see that? Yes. Awesome, I'm seeing some thumbs up. So, um, okay. Let me just share it the other way, actually. There we go. Okay, so I can't see your faces. I can just see my screen. So um, I'll definitely leave time at the end for questions. But if you have a burning interruption that you want to make, I won't take offense. So feel free to just unmute and, and ask me a clarifying question. Um, my name is Sam. Samantha is also a good name for me. Um, I go by both. I am the Noose River Keeper with Sound Rivers. Uh, we're an environmental uh, nonprofit. We're based in um, Southeast North Carolina. I'm based in Raleigh, um, but I work the entire Noose watershed. So the 6,235 square miles that is the watershed um, from Durham, Person County, all the way down to uh, New Bern, Craven County um, is pretty much where I've been working. Um, and I Hey, Sam, if you're trying to share your screen, I don't think uh, folks can see it. Oh, just have okay. Well, thank yeah. you for letting me know. That's of course. Uh, definitely, I want you all to be able to see my screen. So let's try again. How's that? It's good on my now? end. Yes. Good on your end. Okay. Okay. It's still, it's not in presentation mode. Oh, there you go. Now it's in presentation. Okay. Mode. <laughs> Great. Thank you all. I was a high school teacher for a handful of years and technology was always the thing. So I really appreciate uh, folks helping out with that. Um, so I just want to share a little bit about what a Riverkeeper does. It's a strange job title, um, not self-explanatory. Basically my role, and I'm one of 15 Riverkeepers in the state of North Carolina. Um, our state is awesome. We have the most river keepers of any state in the country. Um, we love our watersheds and our role, we're all housed under different nonprofits. Um, basically what we do is we are a hotline. So we're investigators of pollution issues. People, I got a call this morning from someone reporting a fish die off in the lower news. And so we'll go and take water samples and investigate um, and help the responsible state agencies figure out what's going on from a water quality perspective. Um, so a lot of it is water quality science, um, certainly a lot of education. Like I mentioned, my background is in uh, education and teaching. I taught environmental justice. Um, and so a lot of what we do is connecting with community. Um, and we're also lobbyists and advocates. So we work hand in hand with local um, and state officials. And sometimes we work on a federal level trying to get better policies passed for our water. Um, and also, of course, you know, for our communities. And so I mentioned I work in the entire Noose watershed, just a visual here. Um, the upper Noose is the darker green and the lower Noose is kind of harder to see, but it's that shape on the on the Eastern side flowing all the way down to New Bern. Um, and so this is the shape of the Noose watershed. Every single tributary that flows into the Noose River is part of that watershed. So um, that you know starts up here in Falls Lake um, technically, the beginning of the noose is where the flat and the Eno rivers meet, and then they form the noose, flows into Falls Lake, which, as we know, is a drinking water supply, major drinking water supply, and makes its way through Raleigh. This is kind of a typical noose river face in Raleigh. Through Kinston, where it gets swampier, wider, flows a lot uh, more slowly. Through New Bern, where it starts to get estuary-like qualities, a little more salty. And then all the way in Oriental where the river mouth is six miles wide. Um, actually, fun fact, the widest mouth of any river um, in the country. So it looks like an ocean at the mouth of the Noose River. And all of these are different faces of um, this watershed. Durham is split between the Noose and the Haw River watershed. So Southeast Durham is in the Noose River watershed. And the reason why I'm talking about this context is because I just wanted to sort of place us in a larger picture. I am gonna hone in on the work that I've been doing in Southeast Durham. Um, but I just wanted to sort of explain, you know, this is the context of the Noose watershed um, and all of the folks who rely on this 6,235 square mile watershed um, live throughout this shape. Um, I was grateful for the opportunity to paddle about 150 miles of the Noose River last year um, in an 11 day trip um, and to document some issues all the way from Smithfield down to New Bern. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm based here in Raleigh, so get to see a lot of the upper watershed issues regularly. 
And in the time that I've been um, working in this role, Lick Creek, the watershed, which is sub-basin of the Neuse River in southeastern Durham County, has become about a quarter of my total time. Um, so out of the entire giant watershed, 275 miles of river, I have been focusing about a quarter of my time in Southeast Durham. And the reason why I've been focusing so much time is because there have been significant water quality issues that were brought to my attention by locals who are organizing and part of the community in Southeast Durham. And when I started engaging, I documented um, some significant issues that have warranted a lot of my time and focus. So I'd like to share with you all some of um, what we've sort of learned through our uh, over a year now in monitoring water quality in Lick Creek and the implications for sort of the broader um, broader move right now as Durham is sort of developing at a really fast pace and water quality is kind of gaining more and more focus. So a little background just on the Lick Creek watershed. It is part of the Noose watershed. So it's a sub watershed. It's about 22.9 square miles. This is a picture of it. You can see that it encompasses a large portion of Southeast Durham and it flows into Falls Lake. So this creek is a tributary of Falls Lake, which as I mentioned, is a significant drinking water source. Um, the creek itself is listed as biologically impaired. And this has been since 2006, it got that designation. And what that means is essentially it wasn't supporting enough aquatic life um, as it should. And so it gained that designation um, and that was back in 2006. And since then, obviously a lot has changed in the watershed, which I'll talk about. Another important piece is that this area and much of Durham, actually a little bit over half of Durham County is within the Triassic Basin which is essentially just an area where there are specific kind of soil series that are highly erosive, um, characterized by a lot of clay, fine particulate soils. And that's important when you're thinking about water quality, of course, um, because those soils are highly erosive. And um, when they do get into our waterways, they don't settle as quickly because they're so fine. They tend to kind of remain floating in the water column for longer. Um, so that's important background. There was a watershed restoration plan done for Lick Creek in 2009. And I'm gonna cite that a couple of times because that's the most recent study. The most recent plan that's been done in this area was actually back in 2009. Um, and so there was some strong recommendations made then. Um, I would argue that many of those recommendations were not necessarily followed. And so we are where we're at today is sort of a result of that. Um, and one of the quotes from that plan then was that streams that are likely stable now are at risk from impending development in the area. And that was back in 2009. And so out of all the river issues that there are, litter, bacteria, algae, erosion, sediment, climate change, I have really been focused in on sediment pollution in the Lick Creek watershed. So these are a couple photos um, of some of the things that brought my attention to this part of the watershed. And, really made me focus more and more of my time there. Um, these locals have called these kind of tomato soup colored creeks. Um, this is sediment pollution, clay, fine particles ending up in the waterways. And so when this was brought to my attention, I went out and did an initial round of sampling. And what I found was that this is the most significant sediment pollution that I have documented in the Noose River watershed so far, period. Um, and that has been the case on an ongoing basis um, that to this day, I have not yet seen um, as significant of sediment pollution happening anywhere in the watershed as I have consistently in Lick Creek. So I wanna talk about where this is coming from um, and you know some of the findings that we've concluded. This map shows our key sampling locations. Now I've done, um, I've added some sites and taken away some sites over time, but these key sites have been consistent on a biweekly basis. I've been out here sampling um, at these locations. And the reason why I chose these sites was because they are adjacent to ongoing land clearing developments. Um, and what I mean by that is these are previously forested areas that have in the most cases been annexed by the city 
and are now being converted into large subdivisions um, for the most part. And if you drive around this area, if you live in this area, if you're familiar with this area, you know what I'm talking about. Um, there's a significant amount of these. In fact, in the past uh, 10 years, this part of the watershed has changed so significantly that the people that I know who live here, um, who still have homes in these once rural areas, say that it's really no longer recognizable. Um, and I'll show some more photos of that. But essentially, I chose these locations because I wanted to document the impacts that these land clearing uh, developments are ha having on our waterways and to hopefully um, encourage the city of Durham to pass stronger protections for these waterways. So what have we found? I'm not expecting anyone to make a ton of sense of this. This is an illustration mostly. The red is samples that do not pass the state standards. So the state standard is 50 nephilometric turbidity units NTU. What I mean by state standard is the state says, if a waterway, a surface waterway is higher, sorry, that's my, my dog at the door. If a surface waterway has more than 50 NTU in terms of turbidity and sediment, then it's not healthy. That's not a healthy surface waterway. So these, all these sites in red, these are throughout the Lit Creek watershed. You can see, maybe you can see the 550 on there. There's a 600 on there. These are, you know, many times higher than the state standards. And again, this is the most significant sediment pollution issue that I have seen in the Noose watershed. And this is ongoing. So you can see the data goes back to this time last year and ongoing, um, ongoing currently. I was just out there last week. And this is some of the stuff that we're seeing. Um, we're, you know, orange colored streams. On the left-hand side, this is a creek called Martin Branch, which is just filled with sediment. And on the right-hand side, this is a picture that I took last Friday of that creek flowing into Lit Creek. So you can see the difference in the water quality just with your eyes. Um, you can see that that sediment filled stream is meeting a much clearer Lit, Lit Creek and polluting it. And that device in the left-hand picture is one of my meters that I use to sort of document those turbidity levels. And this is a very classic um, photo that I've been taking every other week in this area. Just a few more to sort of drive that point home where you can see the sediment pollution impacting the creek. And I wanna be clear that because this is bringing a waterway that is owned by all of us, this is a public waterway, because this is bringing that waterway higher than the state standard in terms of turbidity, this is a Clean Water Act violation. We all under the Clean Water Act are promised fishable, swimmable, drinkable waters. This waterway is none of those things. And so this is, you know, a Clean Water Act violation. And to summarize some of that data, um, the most profound sediment violation that we documented was 3,900% above state standards. Um, we've measured that, that sediment levels in Martin Branch at over 500 NTU and over 1,000 NTU. So again, the state standard is 50. And this picture here on the bottom right is just a comparison of a dirty creek that runs adjacent to a development site and a creek that does not run through any development sites. So just really really clarifying um, that, you know, there's a problem here that is not a background condition. And I wanna also flag that we didn't, we don't just do turbidity sampling. We've done a few rounds at this point of sampling for macro invertebrates who fellow nerds out there, benthic macro invertebrates are basically the foundation building blocks of all aquatic life. They're the little tiny critters, um, the different caddisflies, mayflies, stoneflies, um, dragonflies that kind of live at the bottom of the creek. And when we've done these assessments, uh, what we're trying to determine is the health of the waterway. And we've done these assessments throughout the Lit Creek watershed. And again and again, what we've found is that the, the stream that was, the streams that are impacted by development have less biological diversity than those that are not. And so here is a comparison of the turbidity measurements. Um, you can see Rocky Branch. I've only done those sites four times total now. Um, Rocky Branch is a background site. So this is an unimpacted stream. 
Martin Branch is a stream that runs adjacent to a large development. You can see the difference in turbidity levels. That's consistent. The unimpacted stream is clean. The impacted stream is extremely not clean. And you can see the difference in macroinvertebrate life. So the macroinvertebrates are very much damaged by all the sediment pollution. They rely on the rocky substrate, leafy substrate, some riffles, basically a complex stream ecology to live. And when all of that is choked out by sediment, the macroinvertebrates can't live either. So here we have the rocky branch is the reference site in blue, meaning the unimpacted site um, and much more EPT abundance, which is the um, kinds of more sensitive, notable macroinvertebrate species than the other impacted sites. So all of this to say, um, we've been documenting that the turbidity and sediment pollution that is flowing from developments has had significant impacts on stream water quality and uh, the health biotic integrity of these creeks. And this sediment is making its way into Falls Lake. Because the sediment is so small particulate in a small size, it is easily transferred all the way down the stream channel and into Falls Lake. As part of my job, we do aerial monitoring flights where we go into tiny planes and fly above the watershed to see what we can't see from the ground. And again and again, this is Lick Creek here, flowing into Falls Lake right here. And on this side, you can see the sediment here pouring into Falls Lake. Um, I work with the owner of the marina not far from here, and he has seen with his own eyes the sediment changing the levels of, um, of, of basically how the structure of the stream works. And that's going to be a problem for his business down the line. So uh, just to note, you know, this isn't just isolated to Lick Creek. This is impacting Falls Lake, and it's therefore impacting everyone who relies on Falls Lake for drinking water, recreation, and the like. So all of this is why some of you may have heard that recently Sound Rivers, in partnership with the Southern Environmental Law Center, filed a lawsuit um, against one of the major developers, out-of-state developers, um, in the Lick Creek watershed, because we pinned pollution on them. This is, this is you know, certainly not to say that they're necessarily the only ones contributing pollution in the Lick Creek watershed. I'm sure that there are others out there who are doing the same, but we, we were able to pin some significant sediment pollution um, in some of the photos that I showed you on one big developer. And um, unfortunately, they are continuing to dump sediment into the creek, at least as, uh, as recently as last Friday. And so um, this is why we're working with Southern Environmental Law Center to bring them to court and to essentially force their hand in addressing this issue so that they're not continuing to pollute the creek. But what we're really after is systemic solutions. Um, like I mentioned, you know, this is a problem that um, is going to continue if we don't pass stronger environmental regulations to prevent this from happening because of the sort of perfect storm of a rapidly developing background. We know, you know, Southeast Durham is really rapidly developing as are other parts of Durham County um, and the Triassic soil conditions. We have this sort of perfect storm where we need stronger protections to prevent this from happening. The photo on the left is a standard um, sediment and erosion control practice that should be pumping out clean water but because of that perfect storm is pumping out dirty water. And this is an example of a systemic solution. We need we, in the need for a systemic solution. We need a better practice. We need better management practices than this because this is clearly not doing it for our creeks. And we also need to address the many loopholes or so-called variances that we have. Durham on paper has very strong protections for creeks and streams, uh, strong buffer recommendations, and recently passed strong protections that require more trees to be left on the landscape. However, there are often variances or exceptions granted for large developers. This is an example of one developer who was given permission by the city to log and clear cut all the way up to a creek, including in a wetland area. And this is, you know, again, Durham sort of granting permission to these large, um, many out of state developers to sort of do these damages. 
And this is just one development um, out of, you know, so, so, so many. So to sort of move towards more of a, um, more of a why does this matter sort of place, um, maybe some of you are wondering why we should care about sediment pollution at all. I know that I get the question a lot, you know, who cares, it's just dirt. Um, but I wanna be clear that, you know, this matters, this is a significant issue for aquatic habitat. Um, as I mentioned, it covers up, you know, the homes and the habitat for a lot of these benthic macroinvertebrates, mm -hmm. building blocks for aquatic life. That's a food source for fish species. Um, so it reduces food for fish. Um, and it also, you know, makes the stream channel cloudier. It reduces visibility. It reduces oxygen. So when I'm sampling for turbidity, I'm also sampling for oxygen. In the really turbid streams, there's less oxygen available. And that's a problem for fish. Um, it increases water temperatures. And it also often co-occurs with bacteria. Um, so it's a water quality issue for sure. And, you know, I guess before I go here, I want to also say it's an issue for us humans as well. Um, you know, those of us who are interested in drinking the water and fishing in the water, those of us who are interested in having, you know, clean um, waterways in our backyards, um, this is a quality of life issue for everyone as well. So I like to think of this, you know, I'm, I don't work just on the river. I work um, in the interest of communities who rely on the river. And I definitely think that this is a community issue, uh, not just a creek issue. And this is just how the sediment sort of falls into the streams. You can see on the right-hand side, my foot is just buried. So this is burying aquatic habitat, just to really hammer home that point. Um, that's all aquatic habitat underneath that sediment. That's mobile sediment. I think I just covered this turbidity in us, just hammering home that this impacts us. So I'm gonna talk just a couple minutes and then I'm gonna wrap up and we can have questions, but just about what can be done. Um, there is a lot of ways that I think we can be approaching this together. And I wanna acknowledge some of the work that's been done. Uh, the 2009 Lick Creek Watershed Restoration Plan stated clearly that given the imminence of future development in the watershed and the susceptibility of Triassic so soils and stream channels to erosion and the downstream drinking water supply, which is Falls Lake, we believe the focus of the Lick Creek watershed restoration plan should be to minimize future impacts and to preserve high quality areas. This has not been done since 2009. And now we're seeing significant land conversion in this part of the watershed without adequate environmental protections. And the result is what I just spent the past handful of minutes explaining. And so if we were to follow the recommendations of the 2009 watershed restoration plan, I think here's sort of what we could do. First of all, Durham has an ongoing watershed restoration study. They just recently announced that they are going to be putting together a watershed restoration study for Lick Creek, Stirrup Iron Creek, and Briar Creek. Now, it is inc incredibly important that this watershed restoration study takes into account the damage that, has being, that is being done right now from ongoing developments. So I want to point out that this map is the same map I showed earlier with a few more points on it. You can see in blue, the sampling points that I showed in the beginning, which are my sampling points. In red are developments, just to give you a sense of where all of those land clearing projects are. In orange are the city's sample sites. So the city of Durham does ongoing sampling of Lick Creek in its regular water quality monitoring. And I have, brought this up with the city and we'll continue to bring it up. And I think it's important for all of us to bring up that if we're going to do a watershed assessment of Lick Creek, we need to look at where the damage is being done. There are no active developments around the sites where the city of Durham has been sampling, which has resulted in the city's sample sites and sample data being much less problematic, much less turbid and much more clean than the sample sites that I have been sampling at adjacent to these developments. If we're going to do a watershed assessment and an honest one, we need to consider and take a look at these impacts, not just unimpacted areas. And so I will say the development is moving east towards the city sample sites, but it's not there yet. And so um, one key thing we need to do is be studying the impacts. Um, so I would ask you know, for not only Sound Rivers doing that, but for other organizations who are interested in water quality sampling and for other folks who live in the community, um, who live in, you know, maybe seeing this stuff happen um, in Southeast Durham to 
help us take pictures, help us document the issue, um, because we're sort of filling in the gaps, um, the data gaps here of um, the impacts that aren't necessarily being currently studied. Um, so that's a key thing. Also, you know, speaking out at city and county meetings, I know everyone here is um, very involved um, already in that. And just to say, um, creating, you know, making sure that the city hears that we can have housing um, and clean water at the same time. Um, and we don't want to be pitting those two things against each other, but we certainly support development and growth in the city um, and certainly also want to see that that growth accompanies a promise um, for the Clean Water Act and, and the promise to uphold the Clean Water Act. Um, and also to flag SCAD, um, the um, ordinance that the that is coming up basically to, I think everyone here is probably familiar with, to just sort of revamp um, the low-income housing um, regulations. There are a um, number of problems in that amendment that would essentially green light more of the same. Um, and we wanna, you know, basically what we're calling for is to put the pause on annexing large scale developments in this part of the watershed until a new and honest watershed restoration plan can be put in place and stronger protections can be put in place. Um, and we haven't seen those yet. So um, until that can happen, we're essentially asking for a, a careful pause and some responsible rethinking of what we need to do to protect our waterways. And so I think that is all that I have. Um, and on that point, I'm happy to stop sharing and just take any questions if folks have them. And I see someone in here asked for a copy of the PowerPoint and I'm happy to share that as well. And I'm happy to share any of our data as well. We, you know, we're happy to communicate all of our findings in the different parts of the watershed. Sam, are, are, is Sound Rivers putting together like some best practices for developers to see, you know, how easy it is to sort of change their methods of, of um, around clearing land and protecting the water? <clears throat> yes, that is, thank you for that question, Maggie. That's one thing that we're working on right now. Um, part of our, you know, part of the resolution for this legal case is that we hope to create a gold standard for developers. Um, we don't believe that Durham's regulations are a gold standard right now, but we, you know, they could be. And certainly there are a lot of practices um, including, you know, utilizing, leaving more trees on the landscape, utilizing bigger riparian buffers. Those are two easy ones, low hanging fruit, but um, there's a lot of sediment and erosion control practices and stormwater practices that can be adopted um, if developers choose to, um, or if essentially if they're encouraged to. Um, and so, yes, we're hoping to sort of work with that site as an example to create a gold standard that other developers can choose to use or um, be requested to use um, in order to get their rezonings approved. There's a question. I see the question in the chat. Can yep. the city create an ordinance requiring the developers to set up stream monitoring that is reported publicly? The city can do, the city has a lot of leeway with the ordinances that it passes. I don't know if all of you were following recently, this is very wonky, but two amendments were just passed to the ordinance regarding development as a result of this research, essentially, as a result of community members um, who are organizing and have been asking the city week after week to do better. Um, both of those ordinances were intended to address water quality issues and unfortunately fell very short. As so many, you know, so often happens, they get watered down over time, um, lose their teeth, and what you know, we have seen is that they're not doing the trick to reduce pollution in the creeks yet. Um, and one of the main issues is that they're not tied to clean water standards. So no one is required to sample the creeks and say, it has to be this clean otherwise or else. Um, you know, so we're essentially filling that role, um, but certainly the city of Durham could be filling that role. Samantha, I have a question. Um, how, what would you say are the best um, resources for identifying watersheds, like looking up, you know, kind of what falls into a specific watershed? And also um, sometimes I've been asked or trying to find the names of these smaller creeks that flow into the larger creeks. And often they don't have names on a map that I'm looking at, but do you have a recommendation for a resource for finding out those names? 
just as a way of communicating. Yeah, um, and I'm happy to share these links too, but um, for watersheds, there's a, so the Department of Environmental Quality has a lot of really great interactive maps. One of them is the HUC map or HUC map. And you can see all the watersheds and sub watersheds and just kind of scroll around. It's interactive. You can see where you are and you can also search for a place and it'll highlight where it is. Um, and then for stream names, um, stream stats is another really good one. If you're um, a fellow nerd and not only want to know the name of the stream, but the drainage area and the um, just, you know, all kinds of different data about it, um, you can you can use stream stats and then for those smaller streams that don't have official names, I'll sometimes go to the library and they'll be in there. Um, old school. <laughs> Thanks. Katie, um, we do, and I'm happy to share those. We sent around some talking points in advance of last um I think it was two months ago, city council meeting. We sometimes, we're, we're regularly hoping to get help um, sort of showing up to city council and saying, hey, we need more action taken to protect our creeks. And we have um, talking points and information on that if folks are interested in, in joining us there. So um, I will share those with the organizers of this to get around. Mm -hmm. John? Um, you mentioned that the city's giving that they have strong ordinances or re regulations on the books, but they've been giving variances, um, I guess, both for the lawsuit and in general. Are, is that the issue or is it um, developers not complying with the rules and there's not enforcement uh, that's really making any difference? Both. That's a great question. And it's part of the problem is that we've got both people who aren't following the rules that exist, bad actors. And our legal case is because there's a bad actor who we've been able to prove is polluting the creek um, and violating current rules. Um, also, there are folks who are following all of the regulations and not breaking any rules and still polluting the creek. And that is because our regulations aren't strong enough. And they're not tied to water quality outcomes. So again, no one is saying you have to not pollute the creek. Um, you know, in Durham, no one is taking water quality samples and saying, well, this is too high. You're violating your rules. They're saying, well, if you're, you know, doing X, Y, and Z correctly on the property, then you're good, even if it's polluting the creek. And that's a problem. We need, what we usually are asking for is we need clean water outcomes attached to our regulations. Otherwise, they're meaningless. So both. There are bad actors breaking the rules, and the rules need to be better. You, one of the resources that I come across, and it's more about sort of um, continuity of wildlife habitat, but North Carolina wildlife has put together a um, what they call the Green Growth Toolbox. And it's basically meant for, are you familiar with it, Sam? Yeah, so it's meant for you know developers to use to assess their land so that they um, will help maintain contiguous green space from, from one development to another. Um, I haven't looked into it enough to see what that toolbox might be doing for um, clean water. Sam, maybe you know a little bit more. Yes, I can speak to that. Uh, currently, it's just working with developers and making sure that they are, if they are clearing, clearing the land, making sure that they're replanting um, native plants or trees. Uh, that's mostly been our chapters working on that. I do not believe we have anything that's related to turbidity levels, um, but I'm sure that is something we could look at. That would be awesome. Um, and I think there are some great resources out there that mm. do relate to best practices and sediment and erosion mm. control. Um, and the issue I think is that they're voluntary and it requires, you know, 
a developer to choose to pursue these um, or to really be encouraged to on behalf of decision makers. And that's where we're at is we need to, you know, find ways to shift folks into choosing to take these actions or to requiring them if we um, if we can require them. Um, but I think the single best thing that we can do that we can be advocating for that's good, that has, you know, across the board benefits, um, not just for sediment, but for, you know, for um, species diversity and for environmental justice, um, quality of life and heat islands is keeping trees on the landscape. Replacing trees is not as good as retaining trees. Um, the number one issue that is leading to turbidity is the removal of trees, mass grading and blasting, and then the rains come and all of that runs off into our creeks. Keeping vegetation on the ground is the best thing that we can do to protect our creeks from turbidity, erosion, and to have all those other co-benefits. So that's kind of our main talking point. And the city of Durham did just gain some notoriety for passing an amendment that is a mass grading amendment. And it, you know, is supposed to reduce the total acreage allowed to be graded and cleared. Um, I'm not gonna get into the weeds on that now unless folks really want to, but I'm happy to, um, but we've done some pretty detailed studies of that um, and some pretty detailed math, including working with folks who live in that community um, and are very clear that, you know, that is not going to go far enough and it's not going to make a big difference on the ground. Um, the on the ground effect is going to be much the same. Um, so I'm happy to expand on that a little bit more, but um, we're still saying, you know, we need we need far more um, than that. This, the city of Cary, has a limit of 30 acres for mass grading, hard limit. Um, and that's still a lot, you can envision 30 acres, but you know, Durham didn't do that well. And um, unfortunately the result of their amendment will be that they've created a situation where if you offer low income housing, you can actually have less trees than those who are not offering low income housing. And I would argue that's an environmental justice issue, which puts folks in low income housing next to less trees. And so again, you know, I think the city of Durham can do better. Well, we have about 10 minutes left if folks have um, any more questions for Sam. Well, first of all, Sam, thank you for your presentation today. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> a lot of the water quality issues in Brown and Durham always sort of hit home for me, um, but uh, very appreciative of all the uh, information you were able to share with us. The PowerPoint will be shared uh, in our DC uh, drive folder. Um, and Sam, if you don't mind putting your, uh, your email, oh, you already did it. Perfect. So folks, if y'all have any questions, uh, just feel free to reach out to Sam. Um, and we'll actually use this space now for the last few minutes to share any upcoming announcements. Um, folks want to have any events or any things that they got going on, feel free to share that now, put them in the chat. 